Hey everyone, I'm Hans Ellington. I'm assistant professor here at ONA. Uh, I'm the head of the Rangeland Wildlife Ecology Lab. And today I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that our lab has been doing with invasive species here in Florida's rangelands. But before we dive into these two species that I'm going to talk about and the work that we've done, I think it'd be useful to sort of review the invasion process. Uh, because these two species, wild pigs and tegu, uh, are at different uh, points along that invasion process. And because they're at different points along that invasion process, we ultimately have different management goals, different research goals, and different priorities. Now, one of University of Florida's specialties in research and extension activities is related to invasive species. Hundreds of faculty and extension personnel at, at UF have programs related to invasive species. And we all benefit from collaboration and coordination with each other. Uh, and for me and my program, this collaboration and coordination has been facilitated by groups like the uh, UFIFAS Invasive Species Council. And so even portions of this talk have been adapted from the work of several other invasive species council members as well. So I want to acknowledge that uh, up front. So uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah. All right. So let's start uh, off with some important terms. And the two uh, probably most important terms is what is a native species and what's a non-native species. So a native species, anything that occurs naturally in a specific geographic area. And a non-native species doesn't occur naturally in a specific geographic area. So for Florida, a native species might be the bobcat. And a non-native species in Florida could be tiger, right? We don't really have tiger here except in zoos, but they're still non-native to Florida. So importantly, non-natives aren't necessarily in the area they're non-native to. They are simply non-native to it. Now, once a non-native species, a non-native species can become an invasive species, but that takes a process. And this is a stepwise process where there's barriers to that process at each step. Um, and not all, uh, uh, because of that, not all introductions of non-native species end up uh, as an invasive species. Now I'm gonna walk, walk us through these four steps, but they begin with transport, uh, and then it moves to introduction, and then to establishment, and then to spread. So, and like I said, not all introductions will ultimately result in an invasion. So when we think about transport of a non-native species to, to uh, uh, well, think about a transport of a species from one area to an area where it's non-native. Nowadays, the most typical way that that occurs is either through global shipping lanes, like shown here, or even uh, global flights, shown here. So we live, these two images show us, we live in a very interconnected world. So there's lots of pathways for introductions of non-native species to occur. Species from Southeast Asia arriving in Florida, species from the US arriving in Europe. Introductions occur every day, everywhere. And they occur for this transport phase. But at that transport phase, not all species that are transported on a plane or on a boat end up getting introduced. Um, so one of the, uh, the Guam uh, for example, Guam has a problem with a lot of invasive snakes arriving. So every flight that comes into Guam gets tested. They've got personnel that come out to that flight and they inspect it to make sure no snakes snuck into the landing gear of those planes from other islands and came there. So that's the sort of early detection rapid response that it can occur at the transport phase, preventing introductions from even occurring. Now, once we're into the introduction phase, this can be both uh, intentional or accidental. And so an introduced species is any species brought to a new geographic area intentionally or unintentionally by humans. Now, most of the intentional introductions are uh, related to ornamental plant trade, forestry, and agriculture. These aren't necessarily bad things. These species don't, a lot of these species don't become invasive or don't even become established outside of human controlled situations. But a lot of our introductions that are intentional are related to that. But there's also accidental introductions. And a uh, sort of famous example of this is ballast water in ships. So cargo ships take on ballast water at port to balance their load 
when they're shipping globally. So if a cargo ship is loaded in the Indian Ocean, it brings on water from the Indian Ocean. And that contains a lot of organisms in the Indian Ocean. Then it transports that, that cargo ship over to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, when it unloads the ship, it has to rebalance so it releases its ballast water. If that ballast water has not been properly treated, those organisms the, of a variety of sizes can then become introduced into the Gulf of Mexico from the Indian Ocean. In fact, this is the pathway that a lot of our famous uh, invasive species in the Great Lakes got into. So zebra mussels and lampreys were introduced to the Great Lakes through ballast water accidentally. And those are zebra mussels there. And so that's that second pathway, but it can be stopped um, as well. Now the third pathway, right, this is where we're moving to establishment. In the establishment phase, there's a lot of different criteria that determine whether a species that got introduced becomes established in the wild. And one of the best predictors of that is climate matching. And so this uh, figure sort of shows where different climates globally match with different areas and how well they match. And so uh, whether or not a species becomes established or not can depend on the climate, the environmental factors, the, the interactions between different species in the landscape. But once a species is established, that means it has a self-sustaining population that's reproducing in a specific geographic area without the need for human intervention. And, and um, uh, that caveat there that it can apply to both native and non-native species, that's because native species can become established in a new area, even though they're maybe native to that larger geographic area, they became established in a new part of that area as well. So now our final stage in the invasion process that we're moving to is the spread phase. And this is when an animal becomes invasive. Um, and an invasive mammal means a couple of key things. One, it means it's non-native to that geographic area. It was introduced by humans either intentionally or unintentionally, and it causes either environmental harm, economic harm, or harm to humans. Now, the biological traits that determine whether an animal or plant uh, becomes invasive uh, are typically shared, right? So typically species that have high growth rates, short time to reproduction, and high reproductive rates are more likely to become invasive. Animals that are generalist, or uh, so they can live in a lot of different landscapes or if their animals eat a lot of different food sources, or if they have really efficient resource utilization that allows them to outcompete native species. These are the traits that allow these animals and plants to become invasive. And when we talk about um, the negative impacts that they have to have to be an invasive species, they can be environmental harm. So things in uh, changes in water and nutrient cycling, altered disturbance regimes, increases in resource competition with native species um, that lead to reductions in native species but they also can be economic harm. So impacts to recreation in our agriculture, ecosystem services, um, or even just the expense to manage that species. And then they can also potentially bring harm to human health. So the uh, giant uh, invasive uh, giant snail that's spreading in Florida has parasites that can be dangerous to humans as well. So, and then one final, uh, uh, well, not final, but another point I want to bring up is that the invasion, uh, that process can also be viewed as a curve um, where early in time here on the, I don't know if I've got a pointer or not. Oh, oh, there. So early in time, this is when the species has just been introduced. Um, this is uh, when it's the cheapest to manage and it's because it is only recently introduced and it doesn't uh, occupy a lot of space. But over time, if the species is not controlled, managed, or eradicated, uh, it will continue to spread because it's an invasive species that has a high reproductive rate. Um, and over time, the management cost of controlling that species or removing that species increases. So we move through the different phases, right? So this prevention phase, that's people treating airplanes when they land in Guam. The eradication phase is when we're doing large-scale trapping or poisoning efforts for invasive species. The containment 
is when we're trying to limit the spread where we basically said some areas are going to have this invasive species, but we don't want them spreading out of the Everglades. So we don't want them spreading out of uh, uh, urban environments. And then finally, uh, if the species has been along long, long enough where, and management has been unsuccessful and it's invaded a large amount of area, then we move into the control and management phase. We're just trying to limit the damage and the negative impacts of that species and we can't really uh, get back down to those other phases very uh, economically. So uh, before we move on, I do want to introduce two other terms that aren't necessarily related to invasive species, but help us understand uh, in these uh, invasive species terminology. So a nuisance is an animal or a group of animals in a species that causes management issues or property damage or presents a threat to public safety or is an annoyance. So nuisance can't apply to a whole species. Uh, it applies to individuals and group of individuals in certain situations. And it can be, uh, it can apply to both native species and non-native species. So in this situation, an alligator on a golf course, that's a nuisance alligator. Um, but alligators in general aren't nuisance animals. Um, and invasive species are inherently nuisance because they cause economic, environmental, or harm to human health. Now, this term nuisance is what we can use as a broader term to encapsulate the term weed, pest, uh, other uh, terms as well. And uh, then a final term, range change. So this is when a species current or existing range grows, shrinks, or shifts over time. And this can occur with or without help from humans. Now, rain, uh, species that experience rain changes uh, don't, aren't classified as non-native, introduced, or invasive. Uh, they are native animals that have naturally expanded their range. And so two examples in Florida are the coyote and the armadillo. These species weren't here 50 or 100 years ago, but they naturally have expanded their range into Florida. So there's those, uh, those seven terms, native, non-native, introduced, established, invasive, and then nuisance and range change. That together, these seven terms allow us to really talk about any sort of species in a variety of contexts. Uh, and they also allow us to avoid terms that are confusing. Um, so the term native invasive, well, that's sort of like uh, saying something is not what it is. Uh, because an invasive species is non-native, so you can't have a native invasive. Instead, what the better term for this species, a less confusing term, would be nuisance. Um, an invasive exotic, that's like uh, adding two things that are the same, right? It's the same, it's the same thing as saying invasive, invasive. So if you can just say invasive. An invasive weed, right? Weeds, that sort of context-dependent term where it's a nuisance plant uh, species. Uh, so. Uh, you can just say invasive. If, it, if you think this is an invasive weed, really that's just an invasive. Because all invasive plants uh, uh, could be considered uh, nuisances because they cause economic, environmental, or human harm. And then finally, it's a good idea to avoid, avoid uh, sort of loaded terms like alien, foreign, uh, non-indigenous. Uh, instead, you can use the term non-native uh, to describe the species. All right, so uh, briefly talk about two of the uh, invasive species that our lab is doing research on. The first one is wild pigs. So most of you probably are familiar with wild pigs. These are uh, wild pigs, that sort of umbrella term that occurs, uh, that covers any pig that is outside of a fence. So feral hogs, wild hogs, uh, feral pigs, uh, feral swine, uh, tiny woods rooter, all of those terms are the same thing. They're a wild pig. They're a pig that occurs outside of a fence. They are non-native to uh, North America. They were originally native uh, in Europe and Asia. And, and these uh, animals uh, can get rather large, up to 250 pounds. The females and males are different in size. That means uh, that can also be uh, described as sexually dimorphic. So as I said, they're non-native. Their original native range is here in Europe and Asia and parts of North Africa, but they were introduced by uh, Europeans uh, as they uh, colonized and explored 
uh, the rest of the world. So they've been introduced uh, to North America, South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Australia, and New Zealand as well. Here in uh, uh, North America, they were first introduced by the Spanish in the 1500s, and they're now present uh, uh, throughout the Southeast in really high numbers. They're also present through most of California and parts of the Southwest, and then sporadically in other parts of the state uh, or the country. And the U.S. has over 5 million pigs. The biggest populations occur in Texas, California, Florida, and Hawaii. And one of the reasons that pigs are really good invasive species is because they have a high reproductive rate. And here in Florida, they are reproductive year round. Um, and so the reproductive rate of pigs allows them to reach really fast numbers. And that's because one pregnant wild pig can result in over 100 offspring in two years if you assume that all of their uh, that pig's original offspring breed. Um, and this sort of uh, math just assumes four to seven piglets per litter and only one litter per year, but we know here in Florida that some wild pigs can have two litters a year. So those numbers can be even higher here in Florida. Uh, wild pigs are social animals. The females and their young live in groups called sounders. They are habitat and diet generalists. That means they're, uh, they can live about anywhere and they can eat about anything. They do need access to water because they're not very good at thermoregulation. And they do prefer some food types over others. So they like hard mass like acorns in the fall. They like young roots and tubers in the spring. Um, but they will uh, eat a wide variety of food. They live in fairly large spaces on the landscape uh, here in Florida. Our best estimate is about 370 acres for a sounder and about 740 acres for a solitary male. Those males will often overlap multiple sounders so that they can maximize their reproductive uh, uh, output uh, by breeding with females from both sounder groups. And, and we know that uh, home range size of pigs is gonna vary on the landscape due to the land cover and the food resources and even the, uh, the number of pigs within the sounder. And all of those things will impact wild pig density as well. So what are some of the, the negative impacts? What are the things that make this an invasive species? Well, there's agricultural damage, there's ecosystem damage, and there's disease transmission from pigs to both uh, our livestock, but also uh, to humans uh, that can occur. So uh, in the US, agriculture damages uh, are over 1.5 billion. Now that number includes not only the damage, but the uh, management costs that occur. So when we think about an invasive invasion curve, wild pigs are definitely on the far right where it's really expensive to manage these animals at this point. Um, the typical way that pigs do cause agriculture damage is through rooting activity and direct consumption. Um, here in Florida and in livestock areas, that rooting damage can impact the pastures and subsequently livestock production. And these are some images from pastures here in Florida showing that rooting damage. And that sort of rooting damage reduces the amount of forage available, and that can translate into direct loss in terms of calf production of pound per acre and value per acre uh, due to rooting. Now, the, the, the cost is more substantial in improved pasture than in semi-native pasture, but that's mainly because uh, improved pasture can uh, tolerate a much higher stocking rate of uh, livestock than uh, semi-native. But that rooting damage also impacts native uh, ecosystems. It disturbs the soil and modifies the soil chemistry and nutrients, destroys native vegetation, alters species composition, uh, and can be a gateway for other invasive plants as well. It will, wild pigs' presence uh, through their walling behavior. So uh, earlier we talked about how pigs aren't very good thermal regulators. That means that they, uh, they get overheated easily. And so the best way for them to cool themselves is to actually roll around in mud and, uh, and water and cool their bodies that way. They're not very good at sweating the way we are. And so when they do this in, on the landscape, they actually impact the water quality by increasing a lot of the organic nitrogen, carbon, sulfate, and calcium ions in these waters beyond uh, normal levels. And when they're uh, walling and sort of lounging in these, in these mud and uh, uh, muddy areas and water, they're also uh, defecating in large amounts because they're in big social groups 
and that's going to uh, increase the E. coli concentrations in these landscapes as well. And uh, this is a, uh, a uh, uh, sort of large review paper currently in review that sort of tried to summarize all the different impacts that wild pigs have on water quality. The increased erosion, the increased nutrient concentration in watering uh, for the walling activity, the rooting will increase runoff and increase the nutrient loading into the watersheds as well. And that rooting activity can also impact soil carbon. And so this is an interesting modeling study that found, that was trying to model that rooting activity at a global scale. And, and if you think about all the pigs in North America and all the rooting activity they're doing, where every time they root and turn up that soil, that's allowing CO2 that had been stored in that soil to release into the atmosphere. And so the equivalent to that, uh, to what occurs in North America due to pig rooting is, is equivalent to almost a quarter of a million passenger vehicle emissions. So that's quite a lot of CO2 released just from pig activity. Now, when we think about wildlife, uh, pigs will compete for those acorns uh, uh, against a lot of our native wildlife that we enjoy, like white-tailed deer, turkey, and squirrels. Uh, pigs are bigger than these animals, occur in larger social groups, and will actively push the animals away from the most productive trees and stands for acorns in the fall. And if pig density is high enough, that can even limit seedling establishment for regenerating oak trees. They'll also push uh, wildlife off of feeders so they can have an impact on hunting activities as well and can easily and quickly destroy food plots. They're opportunistic uh, predators on native wildlife. Uh, pigs are omnivores. They eat a lot of plant material, but they also eat animal material. So the things that they're most commonly eating animal-wise when they're rooting is things like earthworms and, and perhaps some sensitive species like salamanders when they're in those sort of ephemeral wetlands. But they'll also occasionally predate uh, nest because eggs are high energy sources. So if they find them, they'll eat them. So things like turkey, quail, and even sea turtle can get impacted by pigs. And, and finally, there's the, a pathway for disease transmission. So wild pigs, uh, here's an image of wild pigs walling, cooling their bodies down. So that's the same sort of water source that a lot of our native wildlife are gonna use, different sources like deer and, and raccoons. So we can potentially spread diseases that wild pigs have in their populations like brucellosis and leptospirosis, not only to our native wildlife, but also to our livestock. So the same sort of water sources that we've put out for our livestock are gonna be used by pigs as well. And so that's also a potential pathway for diseases to occur like pseudo rabies. And then one of the big ones that uh, the USDA and folks here uh, in the US are really worried about uh, arriving in, in North America is the African swine fever, which could be uh, extremely detrimental to the domestic swine industry if it becomes introduced to the wild pig population here uh, in the US. And one of our uh, big risks uh, for that is actually here in Florida because we have a lot of people coming and going from areas where African swine fever does occur or has occurred in the past. So, Going back to that invasion curve, wild pigs are definitely in this control management phase where the management costs are extremely expensive. So we mostly focus on limiting the damage and minimizing uh, the damage that occurs. And that's because this uh, wild pigs were first introduced uh, way back in the 1500s. And, and uh, there wasn't a lot of control or efforts put into that early phase so pigs, especially here in Florida, have invaded the entire state and are everywhere uh, and are at quite uh, high densities. So how do we manage for wild pigs? What are the best management practices? Well, we recommend lethal removal, right? That's the best way to slow the population growth. And you need to, uh, to be able to slow the population growth. Modeling has shown that you need to be removing most of that population annually. And so the most effective way to do that is to focus on that entire sound or that entire social group. Uh, techniques that focus on single individuals are often ineffective and can even be counterproductive because if you're only killing one or two animals in that sounder at a time, you've just informed the other individuals in that sounder how you did that and they're gonna be more difficult to kill later. 
So with whole sounder trapping, there's a whole series of things that you can do to make whole sounder trapping most effective. And we've got a lot of different resources out there uh, for that. But I wanna pivot a little bit and talk about some of the research that one of my graduate students has been doing, looking at uh, barriers that landowners face in implementing those best management practices. And that's because successful wild pig management here in Florida must include, include private lands. And that's because most of Florida is privately owned. Wild pigs use large areas. They use 400 acres. They, uh, the males might use up to 800 acres. So even if you're doing management in one location, or even if management is occurring in one location, it doesn't really guarantee a reduction in damage in another location, especially if you're a small property uh, landowner. If you've got 40 acres, if you've got 100 acres, uh, the management that you're doing might not really would uh, lead to a reduction in the damage you're experiencing in the short term or even the long term uh, because your neighbors might not be doing any sort of money. So we wanted to look at the barriers uh, that private landowners face because what we're seeing, at least anecdotally, is that most private landowners aren't using these best management practices for wild pigs. And when we think about barriers to uh, addressing a problem or an issue, they also, uh, they often occur in a hierarchy that uh, I'm representing with this sort of inverse pyramid. And so the idea is that if you don't know a problem exists, you can't address it, you can't manage for it. So the first barrier is just a knowledge of the problem. But uh, the next barrier can be a disconnect between attitude and behavior. You might know of the problem, you might think that that problem, uh, you know the problem exists, you want to do something about it, but you're not doing the best thing about it. Maybe you don't know, maybe you can't. Maybe you, uh, so that then the third barrier in this inverse pyramid would be the resources to enact the best management or the best practice to address that problem. So maybe you know pigs are a problem. Maybe you know you need to be do whole sounder uh, trapping to really uh, be the most effective management for pigs on the land, but you don't have the time or the personnel power or the financial resources to enact it. And then finally, sort of at the, uh, at the end of that pyramid is that sort of collaboration that might need to occur uh, for you to actually realize a reduction in damage. And that could be because you're a small property owner and your neighbors aren't doing management the way you're doing management. So collaboration among landowners might be that final sort of barrier. So to look at how these barriers played out in different populations here in Florida, we, we developed a survey uh, and we had uh, 308 Florida landowners respond to our survey. And 131 of those folks were rural residents that weren't involved in agriculture production of any kind. And then 103 of them were uh, livestock producers. And we asked a variety of questions, including opinions and knowledge of wild pigs, the current management practices that these folks were uh, using any sort of damage they were experiencing, other things like hunting, willingness to collaborate and learn, a lot of different things. And so that has taught us uh, several things and we're still digging through this data, but I wanna share a couple of sort of interesting results. And first we'll talk about that, that top barrier, that knowledge gap uh, and what is known about pigs in Florida. Well, most respondents know that wild pigs are non-native. This is great, that's over 70% that no uh, wild pigs are non-native in Florida. That's pretty good uh, knowledge. And that translates into uh, the attitudes that we're, we like to see. So about 70% of the respondents want to see wild pigs either reduced or completely removed uh, on their land. So they know they're non-native and they want to see management uh, that uh, is appropriate for this invasive species. But um, here uh, we wanted to look uh, and dig a, deep, uh, a bit deeper. And so now we're sort of separating two groups out. We have our rural residents here represented by our houses and our livestock producers uh, by the cow. And so we asked the question, are wild pigs on your property? And so we see different sort of responses. Most, the vast majority, 90% of livestock producers that responded said wild pigs are on their property. The rural residents, not as much. 
Uh, still a lot, uh, but closer to about 40% of respondents. Now, what we would assume or what we'd like to see is that if you have wild pigs on your property, that you are conducting some sort of wild pig management. And so when we looked at these numbers, we see pretty good for the livestock producers, right? About 90% have wild pigs on their property, about 70% are doing management. However, over here on rural residents, we were really surprised to see about 40% reported wild pigs on, on their property, but less than 10% were doing any sort of management for those pigs. Um, so there's a disconnect between those attitudes and behaviors, the, the earlier slide, where most people knew they were non-native and most wanted to see them reduced or removed. Well, for some rural residents, that's not translating into actual management. So there's our barrier for our rural residents. But we haven't really found the barrier for livestock producers yet. So then we dug deeper and we looked at the methods that folks were using, uh, livestock producers were using to remove uh, pigs on their land. And, and most of the respondents, so here we had about 70 respondents answering these questions. Most of them are shooting these animals or trapping and shooting them. Um, and, and it's important to note that these sort of numbers in parentheses, uh, the respondents could select all that, that apply. So they could be using multiple methods to remove these species. And they were, uh, uh, for the uh, folks that were trapping over here, that 45 respondents, they were doing a lot of the sort of recommendations that we have for improving trapping success with uh, two sort of important caveats here. Uh, not very many, uh, less than half, were monitoring their traps with game cameras and uh, a lot fewer, only eight respondents uh, were doing whole sounder removal, right? This is the most effective management. This is the management that's gonna remove um, tens uh, of pigs, um, tens and tens of pigs every time instead of one pig at a time. This is the sort of management that sees actual sort of damage reduction at least in the short term. So um, then we asked uh, the livestock producers what uh, their impression was about their management uh, activities and whether they thought they were effective. And about 60% thought that the management was effective in the short term. However, uh, only about 30% saw that management being effective in the long term. And so we're seeing uh, effective management in the short term, but not effective in the long term. And the end result of that is ineffective management. So there is our barrier, right? We need to be doing a little bit more of more effective management. So what we still wanna dig into is the reasons why folks aren't uh, implementing sort of best management strategies. And the goal here is if we know why they're not doing it, then we can design outreach and extension materials that will help them do more effective management in the future. And so one, one final plug, we, uh, one of our other things that Bree, and this is Bree here uh, getting peed on by a, a, a turtle, uh, that, uh, that what we wanna do to help guide our, our exploration of these barriers is, is do a wild pig management focus group. We originally had scheduled this for June and had to cancel it, but we still wanna, still interested in doing this in the future. So if you're interested in participating in a wild pig management focus group, where we can have a guided discussion uh, about the wild pig damage that you're experiencing, the wild pig damage or management tactics and strategies that you're using, what's working, what's not working, and how UFIFAS can help, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. We'll add you to our list for that group so that when we reschedule that event, you can participate. So now I wanna switch a little bit and talk about the other invasive species that our lab is doing work on and that's the Argentine black and white tegu. And this is a, the tegu here. So tegus are a, a large lizard. They're ground dwelling, they're heavy body. Um, they have really uh, they're, um, strong legs and claws, a long tail with that sort of tapered snout. And they're uh, originally native to Argentina. They were introduced uh, to Florida via the pet trade. So, the body of the tegu can get almost two feet long, but that tail uh, can get uh, add that body length to almost four or over four feet in some cases. These animals can weigh up to 11 pounds. The males are a little bit bigger than the females. Um, they have that long forked tongue and uh, that sort of black and white striped pattern. And 
uh, from a distance, they'll look uh, pretty smooth skinned. Uh, obviously up close, they're still lizards, so they're scales, uh, but from a distance, it looks smooth. The young uh, tegu uh, less, uh, uh, will have this sort of green coloration, but they're still pretty big. When they hatch out of their, shell, uh, their shells, they're 10 to 12 inches. Uh, so that's gonna be bigger than uh, pretty much any native lizard that occurs in Florida. So if you see a big green and black striped lizard that's almost a foot long, that's a tegu, that's a non-native lizard. It's not a native lizard. Um, now, there are some species that you could potentially confuse uh, adult tegu for. Uh, you could perhaps uh, confuse them with alligators, uh, but note that alligators have a very different head shape uh, than tegu. And then Nile monitors occur in some places in Florida, also invasive species, uh, but much larger and don't have the black and white that they have more uh, brown and tan, uh, uh, yellowish sort of spotted stripes. Now, tegus are highly adaptable and they do well in a large variety of habitats, both natural and human modified landscapes, agriculture, suburban uh, subdivisions. They like scrub and pine lands, habitat edges, scrubby habitats and grasslands. Uh, the only thing that we've found so far is they do tend to avoid really dense forest. Uh, they'll move easily along roadsides and power lines uh, down towards the Everglades. Uh, they'll use canal levees to forage and disperse along. Um, they are mainly terrestrial. They're not uh, semi-aquatic like iguanas, but they can swim. Uh, they are diurnal and uh, they will seek shelter in burrows and rock crevices at night. Now, one of the key features of tegu that makes them particularly uh, uh, dangerous as an invasive species here in Florida is they become dormant uh, they enter sort of a, a reptilian version of hibernation called brumation. So they become dormant in their burrows and shelters from around September to about February. And they, they do this in their native range in Argentina to escape the cold uh, uh, weather. Um, they will do this uh, in Florida uh, to escape cold here as well. So they're not going to experience cold shock the same way that iguanas and pythons will which allows them to spread much farther north and persist than those other species will. And in fact, uh, studies have shown uh, tegu surviving in northern Alabama in the winter uh, with snow on the ground. So tegu represent more of a threat to the southeast than iguanas and uh, pythons do. Tegu are broadly omnivorous. They'll eat plants, invertebrates, and vertebrate animals as well. They'll scavenge on carrion. Uh, they particularly seem to like uh, uh, ground nesting eggs, so bird eggs and turtles and snake and alligator eggs. Um, they will, uh, their sexual maturity is, is not necessarily age-based, it's more size-based. Um, so it's when they reach um, uh, about 10 inches as a male or 10 and a half inches as a female, and this occurs at about two to three years. Now they lay one clutch a year uh, with almost 30 uh, eggs on average. Um, those eggs will hatch in the summer and the females do guard the, the nest and the eggs. Tegus can live for a long time, up to 20 years. So what are the sort of environment negative uh, impacts? What are the things that make this an invasive species? Well, they, they uh, uh, are predators at numerous trophic levels and that can have impacts on herbivores, insectivores and carnivores. So they can impact the sort of natural structure of our ecosystems. Um, they target uh, imperiled species. Um, so things like gopher tortoise, right? Gopher tortoise dig burrows, they lay eggs. Those are both things that tegu like and use. So tegu can uh, kick out gopher tortoise out of their burrows and they will consume their eggs and their young. Uh, there could be a potential impact on shorebirds, sea turtles, uh, there's known evidence of them predating crocodile nests down in the Everglades. Uh, could be an impact on some of our other imperiled species like uh, indigo snakes. Um, and there's a potential pathway for them dispersing invasive plants because they are that sort of uh, omnivore where they'll eat plant material as well. And 
there's still not a lot known about the potential impacts of Tegu and what they might have here in Florida, but there, uh, there's potential concern for some agriculture. Straw, even though Tegus like berries, uh, it's unlikely that they'll have an impact on strawberries because they're in brumation during that time. But uh, Tegu stomach contents have uh, been found with uh, full of tomatoes and full of blueberries. Um, they could potentially spread pathogens to crops. But a lot of this is sort of questions that are, we don't know yet if this pathway could occur. It's occurred in other species, but we don't know yet if it could occur here. Um, they would uh, definitely raid chicken coops. Uh, like I said, they like those eggs and those nests and chickens, especially in coops, are really susceptible to predators like that. They can dig under structures easily. And they cost a lot uh, in, to manage. Uh, Previous years, uh, the state of Florida has spent close to half a million to manage in Kogu in the state. Uh, and there's only uh, right now four known established populations of Kogu in Florida. The, uh, populations, and they're all disjunct as far as we know right now. So this is uh, sort of a heat map in, in EDI maps, which is, stands for Early Detection and Distribution Mapping Systems. And so we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But this map showing the sort of reported Tegu sightings. And so our, our hot spots are in Hillsborough County, uh, Charlotte County, Miami Dade, and St. Lucie. These four areas Tegu are established in and are breeding in the wild. These other reports, uh, while some are starting to increase, perhaps in Orange County, uh, perhaps in some of the other counties between Miami Dade and St. Lucie, uh, we're not yet. Uh, confident that uh, the other counties have established populations. So for Tegu in Florida, they're sort of at different points in that invasion curve. In some areas, they're in the prevention and early stages of eradication part of that curve. In some areas, they're moving perhaps from eradication to containment, especially down in the Everglades when there's thousands of Tegu removed a year. Um, but we're not yet here and we want to try to avoid going up to this sort of phase where Tegu are here to stay, where management is extremely expensive, and we're only trying to reduce the damage. We can still eradicate them from some counties. We can still prevent them from becoming more widespread. So that's where our efforts need to focus for Tegu, whereas our efforts for pigs focused on control and management. So here in Florida, there's a lot of new regulations about Tegu. It's illegal to... Uh, to release these animals in the wild. Uh, they are not protected, so you can capture and euthanize these animals. They are a prohibited non-native species in Florida, so there's no import, sale, or possession, or transport without an FWC permit now of these species. Uh, some of these rules came into effect in 21, and so I think some uh, pet owners that have tegus um, are, have been allowed and grandfathered in to keep those animals as long as they're not selling or uh, breeding them. So uh, management strategies right now, we want to prevent new invasions. So if you have a tegu as a pet, ensure your cages are secured. Don't release unwanted pets, uh, tegus, into the uh, environment. FWC runs a pet amnesty program where you can turn in any pet for uh, two FWC uh, with no sort of negative consequences. Um, if you see Tegu in the wild, report the sightings on Eddy maps uh, or report your sightings to FWC. Having that sort of information lets us know where hot, uh, new hotspots might be occurring. You can uh, live trap or shoot a Tegu that you see on your property. Uh, of course, you must be in an area where it's safe to legally discharge a firearm. Um, if you uh, you can and should seek uh, assistance from FWC. FWC's got non-native teams all across the state that are trained uh, and know how to trap tegus uh, successfully. Uh, they often uh, bait those traps with eggs. And um, if you do live trap a tegu for any reason, you are required to kill that animal. You cannot release that animal back. So. Now I want to talk about uh, another project our lab's doing with Tegu. And so this is in Charlotte County. Um, so this is the area where uh, the Tegus are currently known to uh, be established in Charlotte County. This is just north of Babcock Webb, which is down here. Um, 
As with all four established Tegu populations in Florida, the source of this population was uh, releases uh, uh, from pet breeding facilities. So those releases, as far as we know, aren't occurring anymore, but they did occur in the past. And this has led in, over the last three or four years for FWC to capture over 200 tegus in this area represented by those pink dots. So here in Charlotte County, we're in that eradication phase and we don't wanna to move to that containment phase. So the goals of this project and my grad student, Alex First, is the student on this project is to look at how many tegu are present on the landscape, how far have tegu spread across the landscape, how far into Babcock Web are they, and are the current FWC eradication efforts effective? And to do that, we're doing population estimates from a trapping grid in the core range and a population spread model from, the cam from a camera grid in the sort of peripheral range. So, here is our current trapping grid that we established in uh, March and April in Charlotte County. And so the blue cells that you can see there, those are all cells on the landscape where we have traps. And this little short video is a tegu in a trap. Uh, so far, we have captured 40 tegus. Uh, that is about one tegu per trap day right now. Uh, uh, now, obviously, we've got about 60 something traps out. Uh, but we are starting to see some hot spots in captures. So these hot spots are these colored dots. So the, the yellow dots there, those are all locations that are capturing multiple tegu. I think they, each of those have captured five tegu. So those sort of hot spots, interestingly, um, are moving uh, sort of westward from the hot spots that FWC was seeing in the previous years along this road here. So we're not seeing as many captures along that road. We're seeing more captures over in this area. Now, the other thing that I wanna point out is there's a lot of trapping cells uh, here where we don't have traps in these sort of areas. And that's because what is, almost all of this land is privately owned. And so far we've either been able to get access by landowners not allowing us to trap on their land, or we've been uh, unable to find contact information for landowners uh, because it's a trustee land and there's not a lot of contact information or we haven't been able to get responses from landowners even though we're uh, emailed and called uh, and uh, left messages, we can't get responses. So when we don't have that access, that lack of access is not only restricting our research, our population models won't be as uh, accurate or precise for the FWC but it's also hindering control efforts because Tegu only use about uh, 500 meters squared. So that's what these cell size are roughly. So Tegu are likely here, and if they are here and we're not removing them, then Tegu are gonna persist on this landscape. It doesn't matter how many Tegu we remove from these cells that we do have access to, there's more Tegu being produced here and they're just gonna disperse out. So if we ever want to avoid going into the sort of containment and damage, uh, control damage phase, we need to have cooperation with private landowner access. Again, private landowner participation and collaboration is essential for invasive species management. If it's tegu, if it's wild pigs, it doesn't matter. So looking down at our camera grid, we've got 36 cameras deployed in Babcock Web. These cameras rotate every six weeks through the landscape. This allows us to monitor more of an area with less resources. And uh, we bait these cameras with eggs and that's uh, allowed us to see a lot of interesting wildlife uh, that are uh, actively trying to prevent us from getting uh, tegus on our cameras, like this coyote that stole the egg, even though we couldn't eat it out of the cage, he just took the whole cage and ran. Or this raccoon that spent five hours trying to get the egg out of the cage there until he finally managed to puncture the egg uh, and then he licked it for another hour um, and then left. Or this turkey just trying to figure out what's going on with that egg and why it's not in the nest. Uh, but we have seen a few tegu uh, on our cameras, uh, mostly in this part of Badcock Web so far, but obviously uh, we're very early. We're only halfway through our season uh, and we haven't even analyzed uh, some of the imagery data yet because going through a lot of images takes time. So, um, with that, I just want to sort of say thank you to a lot of different people. We talked about 
uh, two different projects here today that those students, Bree River and Alec First, are implement, uh, imp, uh, essential to those projects. A lot of my uh, lab members, uh, technicians, and others have uh, worked on this work as well. I mean, in fact, I don't think any of my technicians are here in the audience because they're all out in the field today. Uh, these projects have a lot of different co-PIs in, in WEC, including these folks. And then, of course, uh, as I said before, some of this talk, some of this content, especially the invasive uh, invasion curve and the invasion process, comes from content produced originally by Invasive Species Council members. Uh, our research uh, is supported by the Range Cattle Center, by the WEC uh, Department on, uh, at University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida Fish and Wildlife, and the USDA NIFA uh, Hatch Project. So uh, with that, I can take any questions at this time. Um, so the question was, where's Tegu in Charlotte County? They're north of Babcock Webb. It's all privately owned. It's, um, if I can find the map here. So, um, yeah, so this area, it's all privately owned. It's mostly uh, livestock production, a little bit of citrus, a gravel pit, um, so water treatment plants, and then here's subdivisions. We don't know if Tegu have reached the subdivision areas, FWC is, I think, planning on putting some cameras over there. Uh, one of what we've hoped so far has been a dispersal barrier, Shell Creek uh, up here, uh, but there are sporadic reports of Tegu north of Shell Creek, so probably going to be some cameras up there to, to determine if they have moved beyond Shell Creek. Um, so, uh, uh, our team uh, uses a um, uh, cattle pro like what? Yes. No, 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 not a hot shot. Sorry. Um, captive bolt. Yeah, sorry. Couldn't remember. So the question was how to safely euthanize uh, for research. Our IACUC appro uh, approved projects uses captive bolt. Sorry, I couldn't remember the term. Uh, lots of other folks just shoot. Well, so we've got them in those in those sort of live traps. We take we uh, put a bag over the live trap. The tegu goes into the bag. And we tie off that bag. We transport it to the FWC facility in Fort Myers. Uh, in that lab facility, we then restrain the tegu with two people and have to close it directly on the head. No, no, nothing like that. No. No, you can touch a tegu safely. I mean, just whenever you touch any reptile or amphibian, you should wash your hands. But as far as I know, yes, e even the ones that are highly regulated now. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually don't know if, if FWC, what they would do if you called them about uh, pet MST for a pot belly I, I don't know. Biggest? Uh, I actually, I don't know. We've caught some big adult males, but uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. But they could go, get up to 11 pounds and four, four feet long. That's, a lot of that's tail. The body's about two feet and the tail's about two feet. Um, any other questions? All right. Thanks. Okay, before we break, I have a few upcoming events to mention. Give me a quick second to open this up. And Okay, so please join us in July on the 11th for our next ONA highlight. It is Dr. Golmar Golmohamdadi's first ONA highlight, and she is going to be talking about conservation practices for groundwater quality improvement. 
So whenever I send out the recording to those of you that are joining us on the webinar, I'll include this registration link as well as the flyers that I'm about to share. So the most uh, upcoming event is our Youth Field Day, and that's on June 29th here at the center. And we're at about two thirds registration. So there's a little bit of space, probably for about 40 people. So there's still time. The deadline to register is the 27th. And um, you need to get in there and do that. Also, part of this event is going to be an early morning bird tour, sightseeing, trying to find birds. Um, of that event, I think it's only open to 24 or 32 people and we have maybe 10 slots remaining. So if that's something you want to do, you really need to register soon. Um, this is just a current list of our expo participants. We've got about 16 signed up to be with us from 8.30 to 10 that morning. When you arrive, you'll be able to visit these booths on your own and you'll have a bingo sheet that you need to get signed off from every booth. And when you do and you turn that in, then you will be entered into our drawing at the end of the day for some prizes. So this year's class sessions will be held from 10 a.m. until about 1.15, including a lunch rotation. There's going to be five classes, 25 minutes long, and then a lunch break. Our classes this year are Wild Weed Hunt, Horses on the Range, Forge Management Benefits, Florida Waterways, and Wild Pigs in Florida. The event will conclude around 1.20. And big thank you to our sponsors. We have some platinum sponsors, Deseret Cattle and Citrus, Roman 3 Ranch, Sarasota County Farm Bureau, and A&J Lucky 7 Ranch. Our gold sponsors are Highlands County Farm Bureau, Corvetta, Farm Credit of Florida, and DeSoto Charlotte Farm Bureau. And then our silver sponsor, Sarasota Agricultural Recovery Group. We, are, we very much appreciate your support of this event. Thank you. We also have our t-shirt contest going on. So far we have two entries. So please, if you like to draw, take the time and give us a design. This flyer outlines exactly what we're looking for as well as showing last year's winner. And then if there, you click the link there, you'll go to a page on our website where you can actually see the entry form as well. Uh, if you're not already doing so, please follow us on social media so you can stay up with everything that's happening here or join our email list. Every Friday, we send out a newsy email, tells about the latest events, visitors, upcoming events, and different social media um, type releases that we've done, photos, videos, and that kind of thing. So thank you to everybody for joining us today. We hope to see you in July.